We all have met a picky eater. You know, that person who is the opposite of Popeye and just won't touch anything green or leafy? Growing up, my little brother would only eat corn, potatoes, and chicken. And I just thought, this can't be good. Well, it turns out that it's kind of normal. And being a picky eater only really becomes an issue when it starts to negatively impact how that person functions in everyday life. I'm Clint Malley, and this is Real Common Treatable, where we help behavioral health professionals stay at the forefront of adolescent mental health, addiction, and substance use treatment. So in this episode, we're going to discuss the basics of eating and feeding disorders, dive into the three stages of family-based therapy and why FBT is effective as a treatment, and we're gonna learn about a DBT as an alternative when FBT just isn't a good fit. Our teacher today is Alicia Avis, a licensed clinical social worker, a certified eating disorder specialist, and supervisor and the executive director at Clarity Counseling, an outpatient treatment center that's based in Virginia. I think that we are in very competent hands today. So let's jump right into her powerful story about why she got into this field in the first place. I have been in the world of eating disorders for about 25 years. Um, I come from a long line of people dealing with eating disorders, three, four generations of family. I feel I've had some form of an eating disorder. I was someone who was on the other side of the couch and I didn't enter into the field of eating disorders where, okay, I want it to come full circle. It just worked out that way. My field placements were in eating disorder treatment centers and the complexities of the pathology, it was, just really so fascinating because there's the family component, the trauma component, the, the body piece to it. Yeah, besides it being something that's just incredibly interesting and complex, it does hit close to home. But I was definitely in a higher level of care and was one of those people who've been through the system back in the early 90s, mid 90s, where they treated eating disorders very differently. We didn't really know about eating disorders until Karen Carpenter. I think it was People Magazine did a whole spread on her and then it was like, oh, whoa, okay, this is this is a real thing. But even in that, that article, you turn the page and there was a model that was just as thin as Karen Carpenter who had passed away and died from an eating disorder. And the prognosis was a set, it was a seven to 10 year sentence where, okay, you got diagnosed with this thing that nobody really knows about. We don't really know how to treat them. We're going to remove the child from the home. And for me, it was a journey. But at the same time, I know I got out of roughly 20 years ago. I don't have an eating disorder, but I had one and have been through the, the system and the program. And so I'm, I'm on the other side. It's interesting now to see it from this perspective and visit the treatment centers and whatnot, but it's definitely personal. And in addition, there's other people in my family who've had eating disorders and some people who have not gotten better or people where it was other expressions that played out because they didn't have proper treatment and they didn't receive evidence-based interventions that we know are researched. And I believe and work from this position that eating disorders are treatable, they're curable, they require treatment, and it's something that does require work. But this isn't a life sentence. It isn't something that you ever, you don't have to forever be sick with, but it does require treatment. Yo, I don't know about you, but I just got the tingles. Like, what a message of hope. This is someone who has been on both sides of the couch, who has personal experiences with an eating disorder and has overcome her situation. Powerful stuff. Let's find out about what an eating disorder actually is and how they manifest. When I think about eating disorders, we all live in a body and we all need to fuel our bodies consistently in order to sustain life. And so there's in some ways an addiction component, but it's treated very differently than substance abuse and alcoholism because you need food in order to sustain life and you need to live within your body. DSM, that diagnostic manual that we use, they classify it as eating and feeding disorders. And there's nine different types of eating and feeding disorders. The ones that we think of when we hear the word eating disorder will probably be anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and most recent ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And it doesn't mean that they that somebody who is that picky, we used to call it picky eater syndrome, uh, is, has an eating disorder. A lot of people have disordered eating, food rituals, things like that. But what 
crosses over the train tracks is when it really spirals out of control. It's impacting their functioning, their daily lives. And I think some of it is what we're finding. It's really not just a pure eating disorder. And this is where I appreciate Standstone so much is, and where we, we collaborate frequently is it's very rare that you meet someone where it's, it's just a pure eating disorder. A lot of the time there's substance abuse or addiction or trauma. People on the spectrum you'll find who are essentially showing signs and symptoms of an eating disorder that may or may not have or meet full-blown criteria, which is where OSFED or EDNOS come into play. The other specified eating disorders, feeding and eating disorders. So it's that person that just doesn't outright meet criteria. People have fallen through the cracks through all these years. Cause again, it was really just anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. But what about that person who, you know, only eats a few food groups or that person where when they do have this food, they end up feeling like this gag response and they just can't keep it down. And they don't understand why or what's wrong with them. There's no, nothing physically wrong with them that is interfering with their ability to consume this food or keep it down, but they can't. And those people would fall into those feeding disorders criteria. So there seem to be a lot of classifications and defining components of eating and feeding disorders. But what exactly is the difference between an eating and a feeding disorder? When I think of eating disorder, I think restriction, I think fear of weight gain, I think control, guilt, shame, loss of control, right? When it comes to body, when I think of some of the feeding disorders that exist, like rumination, those people a lot of the time want to be weight restoring. They want to be quote unquote normal or have a healthy and balanced relationship with food and body. But there's just something within them, within that nervous system, right? Where that is interfering with their ability or, and, and I think that again, it could be trauma. It could be text drives. A lot of clients where they'll say, I'm just a super feeler. I have a superpower. These foods just make every Every hair on my body stand up. I cannot swallow this. And they have these different food rituals. So I, in my opinion, like the feeding disorders would probably more classify on that end, whereas the eating disorders, you're going to have more of that body fear of waking, that stereotypical eating disorder come into play. To me, they're all quite serious because there's a 10% mortality rate with eating disorders, very high. Now, I'm sure like anything else, there are some common misconceptions about eating and feeding disorders. I think this is a misconception with eating disorders and feeding disorders is that people lose their appetite or they don't want to eat or they're not eating. Most people are eating. They're just simply not eating enough. Even with binge eating disorder, most of the clients that I work with who sit in larger bodies even are, are very malnourished. They're not getting in proper fueling and nutrition. They're not eating enough during the day. They're getting enough fuel in their system, but it's not the right types of fuel. So not all eating disorders are the stereotypical ones that we think of. And in general, no matter the classification, the people struggling with this just aren't getting the proper nutrients. Now that we have defined what eating and feeding disorders are, let's look into who is most commonly affected. Anorexia nervosa traditionally will onset around pre-puberty timeline. Bulimia nervosa average age is going to happen high school, college age. And so, and BED traditionally a bit later on, that's college, whereas bulimia, high school, college, anorexia, usually uh, middle school, late elementary school. You'll see a, a major genetic component to it for sure. Anorexia nervosa, is pretty genetic of all of the different pathologies, whereas with bulimia and binge eating disorder, we'll see a family history of alcoholism, we'll see trauma, we'll see a lot of family conflict. So some of that you can see maybe in the genetic predisposition, but at the same time, there's not one gene. What we're finding is that there are multiple genes that when they come together, that puts someone at risk. All right, we're finding that these disorders are really manifesting themselves on early in life typically late elementary to college ages. So I wonder what environmental factors may be contributing to this early development and what actually causes the development of an eating disorder. I was formally trained in the last year on a very specific form of treatment called family-based therapy, FBT. I know when I treat people not using FBT, we look at uh, the psychology, the sociology, and the biology. And we look at the impact of that and we'll usually talk about how stress brings it all together and ignites the eating disorder and births it. But even that 
doesn't look at it from the lens of trauma uh, and the family history that exists. And so there's this combination of the psychology, how do you internalize the world and experience the world? You also have the social cultural influencers. And again, anxiety right now with what we're living through, people are expressing that coping in a variety of different ways. One of which is I want to control what I look like. I want to be in charge of what I put into my body. When I think about a kid doesn't have much choice or control over their life, but they do decide what they wear to school and they do get to pick out what they eat and how much they eat. And at the end of the day, that may feel to them the only thing that they have in their power and control and then it spirals out of control. As more and more research is conducted, we found that eating and feeding disorders, like so many other things that people struggle with, commonly coincide with substance abuse, addiction, trauma, and other mental health issues. So as we develop a deeper understanding, has treatment changed at all? We don't have a cure yet. So because we don't have a cure, we're gonna still continue to think outside of the box, be somewhat psychodynamic in our work. And so the treatment process is, in my opinion, pretty complex because we don't ask somebody in recovery from alcoholism to live in the bar and drink in moderation six times a day. But we're essentially asking that for our clients who are in recovery from an eating disorder. And food has really spiraled out of control. And years ago, gosh, even in and where it gets personal for me with eating disorders back in the 90s, people, the, the family was seen as the problem. Uh, you would remove the child from the home. And we used to use 12 step. We used to use cognitive behavioral therapy, get better with your collaborative treatment team, and then you return back to the home. Average length of treatment from start to finish for full complete recovery was seven to 10 years. So think about the age of onset for anorexia nervosa and the brain of a 10 or 12 year old and then the brain of a 17, 20 year old. That's crazy to think of, okay, is it the treatment? Is this just neurodevelopment? What's going on here? And so they found that when you remove the child from the home, the length of treatment actually extends versus keeping them home, that you can do a lot more work significantly faster when you empower the family. And so as treatment centers are doing more and more research, as universities are doing research, we're really getting somewhere. I wish there was a magic pill. I wish this was something where, hey, come to session 12 times and you're good, but it really does require behavioral treatment intervention and it requires treatment that is collaborative. So you need the nutritionist, the therapist, sometimes the psychiatrist, the family therapist. From a more traditional approach to treating eating disorders, even that, we're knowing, okay, we gotta keep them home. Now with FBT, what I like about it is that it just really scales it back and it's more minimalistic. It really protects the family. So you don't really need the nutritionist. So now there's more partial hospitalization programs. There's more outpatient groups that are forming. So I just, I think the research, the money being pumped into the field of eating disorders, the policy changes that are happening, I think all of that has supported. You see the family as part of the solution, not part of the problem, and that everyone has a strength and everyone can help in the healing process. Okay, so removing an adolescent from their home for treatment has proven to lengthen the recovery process. But in the same token, it can be detrimental for them to remain in their family environment, especially if it's unsupportive. I know here at Sandstone, we believe in including the family in treatment therapy. And that way, everyone is properly educated, empowered, and aligned on the mission. But what does family therapy look like and how do you know if it's right for a client? FBT is specifically meant for adolescents struggling with anorexia nervosa. Although there's more research that's starting to come out to utilize it for bulimia nervosa, but where the research sits, and I'm a research junkie, is anorexia nervosa adolescents. So say I get a 12, 13 year old who is dealing clearly with anorexia nervosa, we would then start FBT, if the family, everybody's on the same page, they're committed to doing it. We adjust, you know, our lifestyles accordingly to be able to support our me all meals. What it basically says is in about 10 sessions, 10 weeks, we're going to be able to weight restore. So you, it, it's, and I don't even really love doing it with a 16 year old and older, just because if you have a parentified 16 year old, they're really going to buck and struggle with parents taking control and developmentally, how appropriate is it? Um, 18 year old, not a good candidate. There's a lot of good that's coming from family-based therapy. It really does reduce the length of healing significantly. The cost of treatment reduces 
exponentially. And the child or the individual is protected because they're staying in their home in their natural environment. So I just, I see a lot of good. It's really, it's overwhelming to me. Just the, the keeping someone in outpatient treatment. You have a medical doctor, you have a provider. At the end of the day, it really could just be that. Sometimes you'll need an RD on the case. Parents are saving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, granted, there's very, it's a very strategic form of treatment. It's a three-phased approach. Um, it's essentially all hands on deck and then some. So sometimes you're grabbing grandparents and aunts and uncles. All right, the family is on board and you're ready to begin treatment. Phase one of FBT is that parents take complete control and clinicians act more as consultants. In phase one, parents are taking complete control back with food and body. So child is not fueling themselves is the one. So think about when, like I, I have two little ones at home. I am in charge of their food. I decide what they eat, when they eat, how much they eat. And if they don't eat, they're not watching TV. They're not going out. I'm in charge of that. And so we're going back to the basics with FBT. You're empowering the family. You're empowering the parents to make decisions. And so I'm coming in as the expert teaching tools and skills and coaching FBT is like a totally different piece. I'm a consult to the parents. The parents are in charge. The parents make all the decisions. And so when they come and ask you questions, not that I'm coming back and saying, what are your thoughts on that? I'll answer their question if they have a question for me, but they are coming in driving, driving the show. Clinically, phase one usually consists of around 10 sessions. But it's important to remember that at this phase, the adolescent doesn't have any control of their body because the disease is still making the decisions. So for this phase, it might extend past 10 sessions and that is okay. For FBT, first 10 sessions you meet weekly with parents. The first few minutes you get the weight, you meet with child or adolescent to just check in. The bulk of the session, the rest of it is with the rest of the family. And you're unpacking what happened within the week, where can we improve on, where not, where are the gaps of the empowerment for the parent. But even siblings are, are part of this process, it's entire family. We're doing that for about 10 weeks where parents take complete control back from the food. Come session four, we're gonna have a solid prediction. If someone gains a pound a week, we know that we're gonna be able to really do this on the fast track. If they're not, that means that their um, probability that they're going to accomplish a full and complete recovery in a, in a pretty nice timeline, it tells us that this is gonna be a rough road. It's gonna be a long road. So we'll know by session four, by week four, somewhat, it, it foreshadows the length of treatment and whatnot. So I've done this work where come week four, gaining a pound a week, at the end of 20 sessions, we're done, we're graduating, you are cured from anorexia nervosa. I've done other families where we've utilized this in phase one, come week four, maybe they've gained a pound and a half, and I'm then now sharing with the family, okay, we did not meet our goal of a pound a week. I need you to prepare yourself because this may be a longer road than what we initially anticipated, and that's very much so the case. Um, you have to remember it's the relationship with food and body is spiraled out of control. So to ask that child to take control again, or what do you want? What are you craving? The child's not making that choice. The, the eating disorder, the, the addiction, the disease is making that choice. And so to remove that pressure from them is a significant relief. But there comes a point where they start wanting it back. They're wanting those choices. They're wanting that freedom and that independence, which is completely aligned with, uh, you know, what is developmentally appropriate and age appropriate. If they're at their goal weight at the end of 10 weeks, we enter into phase two. Phase two is when you give them back some choice and control. When food's not as hard, we don't have food violence, we're not having this back and forth, you're completing everything that we asked you to do in a timely fashion, you're even starting to initiate and say, hey, it's snack time, mom, dad, where is it? Uh, then they're probably a good candidate for phase two. So you start with whatever's most easiest. So maybe it's the snack time, that's been really seamless and easy. There's been no conflict. There's been no pushback. Okay, you pick your snack. You're in charge of your snack. I'm going to be in the same room. I will be there to support you. You're in charge though. And you do that for a few days. Now we're gonna add in another snack or another meal until it gets to this place where it's developmentally appropriate. Most middle schoolers, high schoolers, elementary schoolers aren't cooking dinner for themselves. So usually parents are in charge of that. 
but you work your way where parents are there, but they're not controlling and serving and plating. Child starts to take that choice back. Now you do that for another, let's say five more sessions. At this point, you can meet every other week, maybe even every three weeks. And then as you've now integrated all of that, they've continued to stay weight restored and maintained more time. Phase three, the final phase of FBT, the adolescent takes back full control of their eating and we see the reintroduction of social activities. Now we are ready for phase three. They take all of it back. They're in complete control of their food, which it, what is developmentally appropriate. And now we start to add in more life, the social stuff, the activities, and we continue to monitor. Phase two, you'd flirt with it a little bit. So maybe it would be, hey, can I go to the sleepover? Yes, we will eat dinner at home. And then you are in charge of your snack and you will be in charge of your breakfast in the morning, but I'm gonna ask that parent to monitor that for you. And they're gonna be stepping in and being a part of this, this process with us. Phase three, you're not having someone monitor it because also the relationship is significantly more repaired where if that child, and what I found when someone's in phase three, they'll come home from lunch and they'll have the foods that they didn't consume in their lunch bag because that's agreed upon within the family. And then they'll say, oh, I was gonna eat that a little bit later. And so there's still a dialogue and communication that's happening but now it's more child-led versus parent-led because it's most appropriate they're ready for that but at this point we're meeting maybe once a month i'll grab the weight in that check we may even start to phase back on that weight check and then they graduate they no longer have a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa and can move forward they can always go in for a tune-up but at that point parents know what to do so if they see anything that looks a little funny or a step back or a slip up they step right back in and if they need to go back to phase one and integrate that step to phase two, phase three, but the parents are really empowered to know what they need to do. But what if the parent or family just isn't ready to take full control of the situation? Can treatment centers provide FBT? No treatment center will be able to if really truly use FBT because FBT, family-based therapy, was meant to be and keep the child home. Most of them where they're treating adolescents will do a modified FBT where the treatment center in many ways becomes the parents and they're the ones doing the refeeding. Most treatment centers are going to use a combination. That is their bread and butter, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, ACT. So family therapy sounds like a great option, but what if the teen that you're working with just isn't a good match for this type of therapy. Is there another kind of treatment that may be a better fit? So as a clinician, I was formally trained in dialectical behavioral therapy and certified in that. So I like to start treatment with more concrete tools and strategies and then start to integrate, hey, let's start to challenge those thoughts. Let's change those thoughts. I think we can all use a little, little bit of DBT in our lives. It's an outpatient treatment that its overall goal is to help you live a life worth living. What does that mean? We need to be mindful. We need to be able to manage and regulate our emotions effectively. We're gonna to need to tolerate stressful situations, even though we don't like it, it is what it is, and manage relationships effectively, get our needs met, set boundaries, maintain self-respect. There's a lot of physical representation with eating disorders and DBT, really does a good job targeting that impulse piece and that regulation of emotion. So usually people are dealing with really big feelings, don't really know how to express it effectively and either are explosive in that or extremely restrictive. And think about the, the behaviors and, and the, the expression of eating disorder, a bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, you're going you know, to either be really hungry or really full. Or with bulimia nervosa, you're going to be filling yourself up or engaging in a behavior that is really destructive and explosive and then restrictive again. And so emotionally, a lot of the times we behave in that way where we're all controlled and everything is fine, I'm fine. And then we start screaming and yelling. And then oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, let's clean up the pieces. And then I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And we engage in this cycle of emotion. But if we wanna build a life worth meaning and, and worth living, DBT gives a, a nice little roadmap, I would say. Listen, y'all, we've ingested a lot of information. Get it? 
Okay, maybe not the best joke, but we've learned what eating and feeding disorders are, walked through the three phases of family-based therapy, and explored DBT as another option. It's pretty obvious that eating and feeding disorders are real, and they are also more common than we think. But thankfully, with the help of professionals like you, they are also treatable. So go empower and inspire change today. All of my love, and I will see you on the next episode.